Awesome. Well, Vinny, thanks for uh, taking the time to come on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. How are you? Hey, Brandon. Good to be here. Thank you. I'm doing well. How are you? Good. I'm doing well. <laughs> um, where are you based? I'm in San Diego. Oh, nice. What's it yeah. like in San Diego? I'm, the... I'm another one of those uh, you know, exiled Bay Area people. <laughs> oh, cool, cool. Every, everyone's like dispersing, whether it's Austin, Texas or LA or San Diego, um, you know, or, or East Coast. I think we, we just kind of find the, we find the spot that's not the Bay Area and we, we kind of get settled down there. Right. I know people have been kind of leaving California and, and Exodus the last couple of years. Um, but I, I know a lot of people love San Diego. I have some friends down there. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's great there. Um, I think a lot of people are leaving more like the Bay Area. Like, I, I kind of struggle with the leave California thing. I just like the, I like the beach. I like the, the sort of mm-hmm. coastline. So, you know, I, I, I see the appeal of Austin potentially and maybe even Florida. But I, I like California. So I just didn't like the Bay Area very much. So I'm happy to be down here. Right. Yeah. It'd be hard to leave the beaches and some of the conveniences of California, but I don't know. It's a, it's a personal preference for everybody. Absolutely. Anyways, um, for my audience who may or may not be familiar with who you are and what you do, can you tell me a little bit about your, your background or your backstory um, to give them a better idea? Sure. So I'm a South African born entrepreneur, you know, kind of like Elon Musk, but much, much poorer. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I moved over to the Bay Area back in 2008 um, and uh, started, uh, you know, I started a couple of companies in South Africa in the early 2000s in search marketing, went to the Bay Area, built a SaaS, um, you know, website platform uh, in 2008, uh, then started a gift card company, digital gift card, mobile platform called Gift in 2012. Um, actually plugged in, you know, uh, Bitcoin into that as one of the first real you know, Bitcoin vendors. And uh, we were one of the biggest sellers of uh, product using Bitcoin. I think at one stage, well, remember one Black Friday, we were 5% of all Bitcoin blockchain transactions that went through our platform that day. Uh, people were just cashing in their, their Bitcoin by gift cards. So, um, you yeah, know, it was a really successful, um, you know, business operation in that, in that sector and space. Uh, we sold the first data in 2014. Um, mm-hmm. And then I founded Civic in you know, late 2015, which is a digital identity platform based upon distributed uh, ledger technology. So we used Bitcoin as the uh, node infrastructure for key signing. Um, and uh, the I- idea was to create you know, digitally verifiable credentials on devices like your phones, where you can use and assert your identity uh, in a decentralized way. So there's no central database of storing all your data. You are the central database for your own data. And uh, so, you know, the mission is basically to try and prevent the dystopian one world government where all your information is in one database. And, uh, you know, we, we built out a platform called Identity.com. It's actually a nonprofit now. Um, and uh, that's meant to be a identity interchange service where you can access different pieces of information that people have about you and use it at other places. So, for example, being able to, you know, one day obtain your your uh, utility bill, you know, through the network and then use it to open up a, you know, mobile phone account, et cetera, things like that. Um, so we built a lot of this infrastructure around digital identity. We have the Civic Wallet, which is a, um, you know, cryptocurrency wallet, stores Bitcoin primarily. We do have ERC-20 tokens. The feature is unfunctionally disabled right now because of high network fees on Ethereum, but Bitcoin works great and we have a million dollar crypto protection guarantee uh, on that wallet. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just a great place to store your, to store your, your, your Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah. I've definitely heard about civic in the past, but just haven't really um, followed it. So I haven't really caught up with the developments and where you guys are at with that. So yeah, to clarify civic is it's primarily for putting your digital identity on the blockchain. Yeah, I mean, primarily we are an identity platform, so we allow you to use the app to scan your documents and then do a selfie. We use facial recognition to determine that you are the person who's on your documents, and then we issue you with a signature um, or at least a private key that allows you to sign transactions proving that you're the same person. And so you can then, you know, we, we, we launched the famous beer vending machines where you can go up to a beer vending machine, scan the QR code, assert that you're over 21, and a beer pops out. Oh, nice. <laughs> and without sharing your personal information, it's just the fact that it's a zero knowledge proof, proving that you're mm-hmm. So can I use that today? Like, is that available, like on the app? 
that's available. Um, the machines are few and far between because we're still working with companies who roll them out. But we've, we've had them at conferences, which don't happen anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Easy COVID. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's possible and it's, it works. Um, we just need to, um, you know, COVID has really hit the sort of mobile vending market um, to some extent because we, we, right. we were demoing these at conferences and we just, there's no conferences anymore. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's a very practical way to use your data if you store it yourself. It's like a digital driver. I mean, the goal is like try and create digital driver's licenses, digital passports, etc. Mm-hmm. And now we have the health key as well, which is being able to store your vaccination records on your device and use it. We're all about privacy. We don't store your data on our, our service. We just give you the ability to host your own data. Yeah, I wanted to ask about health key because. You know, it seems like Civic would be like the perfect solution or one of the better solutions given the pandemic and being able to share your health record or or personal information more securely because everyone's kind of um, freaking out about that right now and whether or not we're going to get microchipped or whether or not um, you're going to be mandated to get a vaccine or, you know, they're going to pry into your health history. Um, You know, all all these things kind of just cropping up, trying to identify people that may have COVID or have gotten a vaccine for COVID or have antibodies for COVID. Um, so it seems like, you know, uh, Civic would be a really interesting solution to apply to this, especially using something like health key. Have you guys like really tried developing something for that or is it kind of just for general health records? Well, it's actually built and it's, it's capable of doing it. The biggest issue is, you know, um, the vaccine is only rolling out right now. So Mm -hmm. we have to, simultaneously get health records into the health key and then find people who are willing to accept it. And we've been targeting companies who want to get their workforce back into work. But one of the big challenges is companies don't want to mandate the people and they shouldn't take the vaccines, right? But how do you how do you sort of differentiate between people who have taken it or haven't taken it? How do you set policy? So the, because there's just no leadership of government right now and how this plays out, in the US at least, uh, it's it's a difficult product to roll out. The tech is there. We're happy to chat to companies who want to do it. But the biggest issue is that you know the HR issues and and what mandates you set for what workers and which environments and who has to take the vaccine to go to work and who doesn't. And it's it's so it's not a technical problem. It's a it's a people problem right now. But the thing, the good news is the technology is there. We built it. It's available. We're having a conversation with a number of companies who want to use the technology. And so we're in the early stages of vaccine rollout. It's only happened in the past couple of days. Uh, but let's see how it plays out. And hopefully we can provide that solution to market. Right. You guys should at least be able to track who's been sick though, right? And then like put that kind of info on the blockchain and then get an idea of what areas and people are coming from that might have it or, you know, where are these people traveling to when they check in? I feel like that'd be another added benefit. Yeah, that's more contact tracing. And we don't want to get into that space. Like that's a huge privacy invasion uh, uh-huh. perspective. Like, uh, you know, Apple and Google, uh, you know, in particular, who have no problem invading privacy, can tackle that industry. We're going to stay out of it. <laughs> okay, okay, gotcha. And I think I think Apple Apple's been pretty good at it. I think Google's obviously got a lot more data on people than anything. Um, uh, but you know, contact tracing is a very complicated, uh, you know, invasive um, mm-hmm. um, thing, which works in some countries and works well because they they just not used to the freedoms we have in America. Uh, I don't think that it's a bad thing. I just think that it's a it's a contrast to you know like c- centralized contact tracing. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's, it's very antithetical to the way we've been brought up as a nation. I guess I'm an immigrant here, but my right. sense is that it's not very in line with what we expect from the U.S. And so it'd be very difficult to get it passed from a constitutional perspective, etc. But other countries culturally, it's fine. The government can know exactly what you do, where you do, where you do it, mm-hmm. etc. And, and they've been able to control the, the virus uh, from that perspective. Is there a way to do contact tracing where the individual can have a bit of anonymity or um, at least privacy sure. in that process? Sure. Absolutely. But, you know, as you increase the, as you increase privacy, you drop efficacy, right? Mm-hmm. So you, you can't have both. And an ultra private solution would say, hey, you were at a place where someone got sick. That's it. You don't know where, where the, you, like, you know, but, and then a, uh, but one where is a lot more granular would be like you were at a place, you were in contact five feet away from Vinny and he had it and therefore you now probably have it. Go get yourself checked. 
like that's more privacy invasive. So the, mm-hmm. the more you go towards privacy, the, the less effective it is. The more the less private you are, the more effective it is. And it's a trade off. Gotcha. Okay, I guess that makes sense. I guess efficacy would drop in that situation. Yeah. Anyways, like what? So what else can you use Civic for? Like, have you guys done any other use cases, like at scale with some companies or with just uh, different test groups, or um, like, or where's your main focus, or is it around Health Key? Yeah. So we we've been focusing really on getting the uh, onboarding and uh, and verification ready for mm-hmm. um, for prime time. We've been working with Johnson Controls in in their buildings in New York before COVID hit <laughs> to, to allow you to sort of walk into a building without going to the front desk and, and checking out a kiosk and et cetera. So we, we've been doing that. Um, and, you know, we've been working with a number of other smaller companies to do onboarding, KYC, and just building out the, the, the wallet infrastructure. So we've actually built effectively like a crypto Venmo type product, right? So you can store Bitcoin, in your in your civic wallet, you have your identity tied to your wallet. You can move money around in the network to other people who have a civic wallet uh, pretty instantly. Um, you know, once the Ethereum scaling issues are resolved, we can reactivate all the other tokens in the network. Um, Ethereum has just been the gas fees has just been too high. It was costing us like you know 150 to 200 bucks a wallet at one stage just to create a wallet for you, a multi sig wallet, which is which is kind of nuts. Um, so we've just stuck to Bitcoin for not right now and put the million dollar protection guarantee. So you can store up to a million dollars and there's actually a you know, protection guarantee on those funds. Yeah, million dollar crypto protection guarantee is pretty big. Where, where do you do you guys have an insurance provider for that? Do you yeah. cold we storage? With, okay, we work, we work with Coin Cover, and Coin Cover works with Lloyd's of London. So it's kind of like you know the three of us, I guess, working together on that. And then we use BitGo as the underlying technology, and BitGo is probably the best multi sig wallet provider out there. So. You know, we've got a great infrastructure product uh, and a network that's being built out. And people are storing, you know, every day more and more Bitcoin with us because it's just a safe way to store it. You don't know if you saw the recent ledger issues that happened with MetaMask, um, mm-hmm. with the, uh, the founder of Nexus Mutual and, you know, other people as well. Just there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of, you know, bad stuff happening in crypto. And I think we offer one of the safest uh, ways to store your, your, your crypto. And, and you can't lose your phone and lose your money. Like, because it's it's, it's on your phone, and, but it's a multi sig wallet, you can drop your phone in the ocean and we can still recover the funds for you. Um, and so that's the good news is that that's why we have the guarantees because your funds are always recoverable. What do you need to, like, let's say worst case scenario happened, you lost your funds. <laughs> How do you recover that? Is it just having a seed phrase or is there some documentation? No, there's no seed phrases. That's the beauty part. There's no username, there's no password, there's no seed phrases. Um, Interesting. Uh, yeah, so the way it works is that we it's a multi-sig wallet, so there's the two or three keys can recreate the wallet. Um, we would have to have, if you lost everything, we would have to work with um, you know our partner with the other, who has the other key to verify the identity that we have for you. And both parties have to agree that it's the same person and we restore your wallet for you. Um, and, you know, that would be after making sure that the original person, like the, we have a whole bunch of safeguards in place that the original holder would never get, you know, uh, you, you'd have to legitimately lost your phone. Okay. Well, that's kind of good yeah. to hear. <laughs> yeah. the, the Managing all those seed phrases is a real headache sometimes. I, I've written down seed phrases and gotten words wrong too. Like it's just yeah. scary. And it's a security nightmare. Yeah. Well, that's good. It's so funny too, because like if I put money in the bank, I only get FDIC insured up to 250,000. So it's funny. You can get up to a million in insurance for crypto. Just crazy how the world works now. It is kind of, it's kind of nuts. Um, Yeah. The world, the crypto world is, you know, the more Bitcoin goes up, the more the crypto market cap rises, the more we're going to see these sorts of, you know, fraud and hacks and happen more and more. Right, exactly. That's why it's so important to have good security and privacy in this space too, and people learning how to do that. Because, I mean, most people they've never had to have control or had control of their their finances in a way that you do with crypto, um, where all the responsibility is on you in most situations. Exactly. So it is good to see like stuff like this come out. It makes it a little bit easier for people, um, and it gives them different options too, so they don't have to rely on human error. Exactly. Um, so in the civic wallet, can you hold a number of different 
cryptos or just Bitcoin? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the early adopters have actually got their wallets activated already before the fees went through the roof. Um, mm-hmm. So they have got, uh, you know, Ethereum, CVC, and then we, we, we can add more. But, the, you know, we built a multi-sig wallet in the back of Ethereum. And when gas fees went through the roof, it just kind of killed the model uh, in the short term anyway. I mean, the good news is it's an identity wallet. So you use it for other things as well. Uh, obviously, your identity. And, and we, we, we can definitely add more cryptos next year that aren't Ethereum-based. But I'm hoping that Ethereum solves their gas fee problem. And, uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah it's, a, it's a big issue right now. Do you think they're going to be able to? I mean, they just launched Ethereum 2.0. I'm kind of skeptical, but I mean, it, it seems it's going well so far. It's going to take it's going to take 12 months, I think, before the gas fees come down to a reasonable level. But we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, they get those down. That's always been a pain in the past. What's next on the roadmap for Civic? Like, what do you guys have planned out going into 2021? I know 2020 has been kind of messed up with COVID and lockdowns and everything. Um, but like, what, what are your tentative plans or what do you have publicly on your roadmap going forward? I, I think our, our biggest focus is just on, on enabling digital identity everywhere and making sure that it's just really easy to, to get up and running. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, identity.com is going to continue to build out the ecosystem that they've got and make sure that the work we've done in Civic is reusable by many parties. We want this ecosystem. Digital identity is an ecosystem that has to evolve. It, it can't be a single player. So we want to be make, make sure we're, we're participating and helping the ecosystem develop. And it's it's now more important than ever with, with COVID, et cetera, that identity and identity documentation all goes digital. What would you say is essential for this for digital identity to really evolve properly? Like what, what does this space need more of? Um, I think we just need um, we, we we need accelerate accelerant points, right? So we need, we need points where um, it's going to accelerate the market and because you know there's demand coming in from places to have identity digitized so you know a good example is like in buildings um uh you know in buildings where you previously had to pull out your driver's license and give it a security guard and like people are touching your things and like they're touching yourself like this gotta go away it's gotta be like scan a qr code Mm -hmm. verify your identity walk through the barrier done Gotcha. Yeah, it does need to be a little bit more seamless. That's something that's really lacking, especially in the uni- in the United States, which is surprising. So there's a lot of countries that do have that seamlessness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Well, Vinny, um, thank you for being on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Taking some time to talk about Civic. Where can people uh, find more information on it other than the website? Do you guys have social media pages? On- yeah. 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 Find me on uh, find me on uh, Twitter at, mm-hmm. at Vinny Lingham, um, or you can find me uh, find Civic on Twitter as well at uh, Civic Key, um, and yeah, we're I'm always happy to chat on Twitter. Perfect. I'll put some links in the bio as well for the episode when it goes out, so people can find that stuff. But um, anyways, yeah, Vinny, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. I know you're a busy guy. Um, uh, yeah, so stay healthy and looking forward to what Civic does in the future. Thanks, Brandon. Likewise. And thanks for having me on your podcast. Of course. Anytime.